Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Hi everyone, I love this frying pan, because nothing sticks to it, and it's extremely easy to wash it. Still, how safe is this non-stick surface? And what does this coating share in common with women's hair theory? Let's find out. But before telling you about the polymeric non-stick surface of this frying pan and about other unusual kinds of plastic, let us travel back in time and learn about how polymers and different kinds of plastic, which nowadays are used almost everywhere, were discovered. In reality, the history of polymers dates from 4 billion years ago, when under the influence of lightning bolts, water and high temperature, on our then young planet, first organic molecules appeared, such as amino acids, which were used in the creation of the first biopolymers, proteins. And nature has not remained changeless since then, which is why in such a long time such creatures, called Homo sapiens, who look consisting of biopolymers, were created from first protein molecules. Our skin mass and almost all body tissues consist of a mixture of water, fat and different biopolymers, just like those of many other living organisms. But since man highly exceeds all other creatures in development, he began using them as first instruments of labor. For instance, trees consisting of cellulose, biopolymers and lignin happen to be a great building material, and biopolymer protein animal skin happen to be great clothes. This might surprise you, but our ancestors had not changed anything for a long time and continued using natural biopolymers materials for over 15,000 years, until in the 19th century such a scientific study as chemistry began flourishing, which finally allowed people to kiss using short life food and other not so convenient materials. The discovery of nitrocellulose in the mid 19th century by Swiss chemist Christian Schoenbein is believed to be the first meaningful event in the history of polymer chemistry. This chemical is synthesized by mixing regular cotton wool or cellulose with a mixture of sulfuric and nitric acids. As a result, this chemical looks like a regular cotton wool, the new properties of which can be easily observed when it's set on fire. It turns out that after synthesizing nitrocellulose, humans managed to change the chemical structure of regular biopolymers for the first time, having synthesized a completely new polymeric material. Combustion properties of synthesized chemical began to be used in the military field. Apart from that, it turned out that new polymer can be dissolved in different chemicals, and even so new materials can be synthesized this way. This was done for the first time by an English inventor Alexander Parks in the 19th century. He mixed some nitrocellulose with alcohol solution of camphor, which back then was frequently used in medicine. It turns out that nitrocellulose dissolves well in such a mixture in some time turning into something resembling jelly. After drying of alcohol, comfort starts acting as a plasticizer, which creates a rather hard and light plastic from nitrocellulose, which is celluloid. This material was the first polymer invented by people. After the beginning of mass production of celluloid, it turned out that its properties and price exceed those of some natural materials, which is why it began to be used instead of ivory and pearls. Buttons, caskets, jewelry and other items made of celluloid were in great demand, which is why Alexander Parks made a fortune. Moreover, an entire photo and film industries came to be thanks to the invention of celluloid films. However, the progress didn't stand still, and many people were thinking about what can be used to substitute beautiful but extremely flammable celluloid. For instance, look at how well an all accordion coated in celluloid burns. The thickness of the film is just 2 mm. Just imagine what rocket a thick piece of this flammable plastic can be turned into. As a result, in 1907, Dr. Leo Beckeland discovered a new kind of plastic when running a reaction of phenol with formaldehyde, an alkali. He named it after his beloved person, Bakelite. But this reaction is rather difficult to run, and it doesn't always work out. That is why I'll show you a simpler and more effective analog. 
To do that, I'm using another similar chemical instead of phenol, which is resorcinol. From a chemical point of view, it's phenol too, but with some more hydroxyl group. To synthesize plastic from it, I'm dissolving it in 50 mm of water. After that, I'm adding the second reagent to it, which is a formaldehyde solution. This chemical is highly toxic, that is why the process needs to be carried out under a powerful fume hood. After giving the mixture a stir, to make plastic, I'm adding concentrated hydrochloric acid. When it comes into contact with the solution, the obtained plastic immediately sinks to the bottom. To start a complete polymerization, I added 2 ml of hydrochloric acid, which is why the solution quickly started solidifying. It's a pity that after polymerization, the plastic contains a lot of water, which is why the obtained mass didn't look like solid plastic. That is why I prepared a mixture of resorcinol with formaldehyde one more time, but this time it was more concentrated. Now, a couple of drops of hydrochloric acid started an abundant deposition of polymers on the bottom of the container. More of the acid speeds up this process, which looks quite mesmerizing. Here in the acid, resorcinol starts bonding with the formaldehyde molecules, creating a branched net of bonded polymer molecules, similar to bakelite, which substituted the flammable celluloid. The difference from bakelite is that the reaction runs many times faster, but because of the high price of resorcinol, the obtained plastic was used only by dentists for filling teeth especially in the USSR. I think many people still have so-called pink teeth, which are called this way because of the color of dental filling. Nowadays, because of the toxicity of formaldehyde, other safer dental fillings are used in dentistry. After hardening, the obtained plastic becomes very hard and light, and it is not as flammable as celluloid, which is why right until the end of the 20th century it was used to make different items, ranging from telephone cases to sockets. Along with the discovery of hard kinds of plastic in the early 20th century, there arose a need for a new elastic materials, especially when mass production automobiles began. The thing is, it takes a huge quantity of natural polymers to manufacture car tires. Caucho was heated up and mixed with sulfur to produce resin. However, by the beginning of the Second World War, plantations of rubber trees in South America could no longer satisfy the worldwide demand for resin. That is why chemists of that time had to invent new kinds of synthetic resins. In my next experiment, I'll show you how one of the first kinds of synthetic rubbers was synthesized in the early 20th century. To do this, I'm using 750 ml of water and dissolving a little bit of sodium hydroxide in it which is a strong alkali. After dissolving, I'm adding 60 grams of pure sulfur powder, similar to that used by farmers to protect their crops in cold frames from pests. In some time, upon being heated up, sulfur starts dissolving in an alkali solution, creating such compounds as sodium polysulfide, and the solution starts having a strong sulfur odor. In order to make artificial resin, I'm cooling off the solution and adding 120 ml of dichloroethane, which is a rather toxic liquid with sweet smell. As the time passes, sodium polysulfides start reacting with dichloroethane and creating long polymer chains called thiocol, which deposits in the solution in the form of yellow flakes. When stirred, these flakes start sticking to each other, creating something like a rubber ball. About an hour later, I'm pulling out the obtained polymer and rinsing it in water, and then squeezing leftover dichloroethane solvent from it. In a moist state, the obtained synthetic resin is rather soft, but it becomes more elastic upon drying. In the 1940s, some resin glues were made from this polymer, but the most widespread use of thiocol and the company bearing its name began with the beginning of cosmic rockets manufacturing. In them, this polymer served as a great bonding chemical. 
So, just as was the case with rocket engineering, the synthetic polymers industry started booming after the Second World War, especially in the 1960s and 70s. At that time, polymers slowly began being used in clothes manufacturing. And when women's mini skirts became fashionable, almost every young girl started purchasing hosiery made of rather new and fair material, polyamide fibers, called nylon. Yes, it really surprises me how light and yet firm it is. How is this material made? To make nylon in laboratory conditions, I took two chemicals, which are rather exotic in daily life. There are hexamethylene diamine and sebacol chloride. First, I'm weighing out 2 grams of hexamethylene diamine, which is a solid chemical with a rather strange smell, resembling that of herring. After that, I'm dissolving it in 50 ml of water, which makes particles of this chemical move finely on the surface of the water. After dissolving all chemical in water, I'm adding some more alkali. And also, to color the solution, I'm adding a couple of drops of phenolphthalein, which dyes the solution bright fuchsia. Now we need to prepare the second reagent, which is why I'm pouring 1.5 grams of sebacol chloride, which is a yellowish oily liquid with a strong hydrochloric acid odor. This chemical needs to be dissolved in 50 ml of hexane, and after that, we can start synthesizing the very nylon. To do this, I'm carefully pouring in hexane solution into the beaker with a dyed solution, and because hexane is lighter than water and does mix with it, both solution form two layers in the beaker and there forms a nylon film in between them. In order to get more of this polymer, I'm just pulling out the film from underneath the lower solution and spinning it on the glass stick. Thus, both solutions, hexamethylene diamine and sebacoil chloride, constantly react with each other, creating a long polyamide bond chain, which I immediately pull out of the solution, which is why it keeps forming again. Polymerization runs very quickly, which is why you can spin more than 5 meters of nylon on your stick. If we take a closer look, we'll see that the obtained fiber looks more like a tube with vestiges of the solution rather than a single thread, because the hand wound on the glass stick keeps dripping all the time. As a result, after several minutes of the experiment, part of the liquid in the beaker runs out and no more nylon can be obtained. After rinsing it in water, we can see that this method of synthesizing nylon is not the most effective one. As a result, this big hang of fibers produces only a small pile of polyamide fibers. But I think it's enough to show the experiment. After drying, the obtained nylon is quite firm to the touch. Along with that, it's quite elastic and can easily be stretched. If we melt the obtained polyamide and push it out of the spray nozzle, we can get extremely thin polymer threads which can be used to make hosiery or fine polyamide threads, which nowadays are used by many alpinists and lovers of hiking. Besides, many fishing lines are made of nylon as well, because this polymer is several times stronger than other kinds of plastic. Interestingly enough, nylon was synthesized for the first time by an American company DuPont, which is known for other inventions in the field of chemistry as well. For instance, the company made dry water, freons, and one extremely unusual material, which can still be found in every kitchen. Yes, I'm talking about the well-known Teflon, which was made by the DuPont company in the 1938, and by the way, it was made by accident. Scientists stored experimental freons in steel gas cylinders under pressure, that is, fluorine and carbon compounds, until for some reason one of the gas cylinders got plugged. It turned out that under high pressure, some freons polymerized, creating white and extremely slippery tetrafluoroethylene powder. After pressing and refining it under pressure, that very material we know under the brand name Teflon, or in more scientific terms, fluoropolymer, could be obtained. What makes Teflon different from other plastics is that it cannot soak water and other liquids like oil, for instance. That is why one of the first uses of Teflon was coating tanks, which made them waterproof in rain. Besides, Teflon is the most slippery plastic, which is why it's used to make many bearings in many mechanisms, and also as a component in many expensive lubricants. 
And it's a real pleasure to cook in Teflon pans. No food sticks to it. And even this small egg on a fluoropolymer plate got well cooked. Besides, it's absolutely chemically inert. It's even used to make containers for the strongest acids. For instance, fluorosulfuric acid, which can burn through any other material. The only thing to remember is that this chemical needs to be handled carefully upon intense heating. Fluoropolymer or Teflon cannot be heated at more than 250 degrees Celsius, because instead of melting, it starts to slowly break down into fluorocarbon compounds and also hydrofluoric acid, which is very harmful to health. That is why you need to cook with oil or water on Teflon pans in order to prevent overheating of the fluoropolymer coating. Of course, in the process of cooking, microparticles of Teflon can flake off and get into food, but according to our research, it doesn't cause any harm to the organism, because Teflon doesn't get digested in the stomach. That is why I think I have blustered some fearful myths concerning the danger of using Teflon and non-stick pants. Speaking of the last unusual kind of plastic, I think young parents and lovers of gardening know it quite well. I'm speaking about the well-known sodium polyacrylate, which nowadays can be found practically in any diapers. That's because of their fantastic ability to soak moist. Of course, it's better to demonstrate this. This container is filled with about 1 liter of water. What do you think? Will this diaper be able to suck up all this water? Let's see. Where is all the water, you might be wondering. If you slice through the diaper, the answer becomes obvious. All the water has turned into something like jelly, because of the sodium polyacrylate powder that diapers contain. In its pure form, this chemical looks like white powder, which is capable of soaking liquids hundreds of times its own weight, which looks quite impressive. Unfortunately, I cannot synthesize this chemical on my own, because extremely expensive equipment is required for synthesizing polyacrylate polymers. That is why this chemical was synthesized only in the 1960s as a request of the American Ministry of Agriculture to find a way to better retain water in the soil. And we can see, today's obtained acrylate polymers really soak water better than any other chemicals I know, which is why it is still used by some gardeners as a hydrogel for plants. Interestingly enough, such hydrogel balls behave quite peculiarly on a scorched frying pan. It is so due to the laden frost effect. As a result of this effect, there forms something like an air cushion in between the frying pan and the balls, making the ball bones of the surface. This effect even was studied in scientific articles made by nature. I will leave a link to it in the description. In the end, I want to talk to you about the sponsor of this video. Squarespace is a unique platform where you can pump up your business with the coolest tools, connect with your audience on the platform and earn a revenue from closed content that's only available to members. Send messages and use data about your audience. Create your own community on Squarespace, so you can manage it like a pro, with a commenting system that supports streaming comments, replies and likes. Don't forget about Squarespace extensions that can easily help you manage your inventory and promote your products worldwide. Go to Squarespace to try the free trial and if you are satisfied, use my link squarespace.com slash toysoy2 to save 10% on your first website or domain purchase. Well, after watching this video, I think you'll know more about some unusual plastics and how they can be synthesized. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to see many more new and interesting